Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Assalamu alaikum. I am Aisha Khan, an ambitious, open-minded and proud Muslim woman. Looking back at the Islamic history, it will not be hard to find women who are innovative, leaders or entrepreneurs. It is said that the property of Lady Khadija, the Prophet Sallallahu first wife, financed Islam in its infancy. Islam then elevated the position of women in so many ways. Join me as I set out to go on dates with Muslim women from all walks of life to find out who they are, what they do and what role Islam plays in their lives. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Meet and Greet show with yours truly Aisha Khan. There is this rare disease that was synonymous with the rich but today affects the common man. A disease whose cure is unknown and if known is pretty expensive. Well today I am at the Aga Khan University Hospital to meet an oncologist by the name Dr. Sitna. It takes courage and lots of hope to save people's lives on a daily basis. Dr. Sitna has been a full-time faculty and consultant oncologist from the year 2013 till date at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Nairobi. She is also the chair of the Kenya Society of Hematology and Oncology, Kesho. I am at the Aga Khan University Hospital to meet the very lovely Dr. Sitna. Dr. Sitna, welcome to the show. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Can I just correct you? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> just call me Sitna during the show. Uh, why Sitna? <laughs> You're a doctor. Uh, yeah. So I, um, yes, I'm a doctor, but um, I am much more than a doctor. Mm -hmm. So I'd like people to see me for who I am, mm -hmm. um, outside of the title and the job. Wow. Yeah. So you want people to see you more than who you are. Right. In yeah. two minutes, if yeah. I told you to describe yourself, right. what would you say? Um, two minutes, okay. So I, I think um, I would say I'm a loving, um, caring, com uh, passionate uh, person. Um, I, I like taking care of people and um, I love family. So that's, that's wow. what I would say. Yeah. I can attest to that. I feel all this love, all this <laughs> compassion coming my way. Now let's talk a little bit about your educational life. Uh, right. Were you always this bookworm? Uh, actually, no, I wasn't. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, I, I was the, the, the child who used to hide uh, novels and storybooks in her books. Wow. Um, not really the bookworm, maybe mm -hmm. until university, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, not really a bookworm, yeah. Okay, so give me, tell me about your journey yeah. into becoming the doctor that you are today. Yeah. Um, so in terms of education, of course, yes, uh, the, 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 the eight years of uh, primary school, uh, which I did at in Nairobi, and then I uh, went to high school in uh, in Shags in Boni mm -hmm. <laughs> for four years, and then um, for medical school I went to University of Nairobi for six years, and then I came here to Aga Khan to do my masters in medicine for four years. Wow, that's like over ten, ten years. years. Yes. So yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So wanting to become a doctor was that your lifelong dream? Uh, not really. Um, it was actually when we were going to, um, before going to university, a friend of mine said, oh, I'm going, I want to become a doctor. So I said, ah, I want to become a doctor too, uh, so that we could go to university together. Mm -hmm. um, to cut the long story short, I went to medical school and they didn't. But anyway, it worked out well. I'm mm -hmm. happy to have become a doctor. Yeah. Wow, you spent so many, so much, you know, time in university, right. studying, studying, studying. Right. Like over 10 years, you're just there. Yeah. Did you have this, a social life? Um, what I would say the last four years uh, when I was doing my masters there wasn't much of a social life because uh, we were doing um, uh, shift calls um, 36 hours every four days so if I was not at work I was at home asleep so there wasn't much of a social life for those four years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there was this time in your life where, you know, you are not very much into the deen, yeah. but it came a time in your life where you embraced Islam. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that phase because it was in university. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in a Muslim uh, background, uh, went to madrasa, but I think during our time we weren't, um, kids weren't like now where schools, most people are wearing hijab and trousers. Mm -hmm. we, it wasn't that time. Um, and it wasn't like something forced for us to do. But in university, I kept thinking to myself, why am I saying I'm a Muslim and I'm not really practicing Islam? 
I'm not doing the things that I'm, I'm meant to do. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot about it and um, got encouragement from my friends and started wearing hijab just before I finished my mm -hmm. medical school. Yeah. What do you think could be the problem as to why us as a society, we call yeah. ourselves Muslims, yeah. but really we don't look into our deen as such? Um, I think maybe it's the foundation. Um, a lot of time girls are told to wear the hijab and they're not told why um, they should wear the hijab. Like uh, what is the true reason why you're told to be modest? Um, it's just forced on you. You're told wear it. If you don't wear it, this is going to happen That's to you. It's always like negative yeah. connotations yeah, yeah. attached to so it. So there's a negative thing that if you don't cover yourself, you're this or this or this. Mm -hmm. But not actually saying, but when you cover yourself, there's this benefit. And um, like, um, I remember when I was in the UK uh, with a friend of mine from Kenya. Mm -hmm. And this is where some of the true, you know, um, benefits of wearing hijab came to me. So she was a non-Muslim and I was Muslim wearing hijab. And we went to a restaurant and there was a big difference as to how the man who was serving us treated us. Mm -hmm. So he was very respectful, very, you know, um, nice to me. And he was very flirty with her. So I said, you know, really big difference. And this is the true reason why we should, mm -hmm. you know, wear hijab. Wow. Yeah. In your years of study, was there any one person that today you look up to? And maybe who changed your life and, yeah. you know, it, it led you to want to embrace Islam even more? Yeah, so the, uh, one of my closest friends, she's called Fakia. She's a pharmacist now. Mm -hmm. And she was like, uh, not just the hijab, but niqab throughout class, throughout work. And she still embraced me as a as a sister, even when I was wearing my short skirts and lot of truly slaying, <laughs> <laughs> truly slaying during the uh -huh. yeah, truly. And she was just like, you know, you're my friend. Uh, room we used to talk about normal stuff, and never once did she tell me wear hijab. But just from her example, that's what took me to Islam. So this actually yeah. goes to show it's not about the outer yeah. is important. It is written it's, in the Quran, yeah. but it is more about having a clean heart, yeah. and that is what pulled you towards Islam. Yeah, exactly. There are so many people who are hijab, but in their hearts, they're not um, um, uh, the true. Uh, what they don't, they do not do what Islam exactly. has stipulated. Yeah. But she is um, a Muslim in and out. She has the Mashallah. humility. Um, the acceptance, um, the knowledge, mm -hmm. and um, is is the how Islam should be taught is by example, not by words. Mm -hmm. And she she's the epitome of that. Wow. Yeah. So I want to know what does it take to be a doctor? Maybe there's a young girl watching out there, and right. she's looking at Doctor Sitna right now. <laughs> yeah. It's like you know what? When I grow up, I want yeah. to be like her. I think it's um, there's a lot of time uh, investment in time. You need to um, invest time. Uh, because obviously it's at least after primary school it's at least six to ten years of education so there's a there's a time investment and that time so for you it's just not eight four four it's yeah, eight yeah, yeah. four six plus whatever number of years uh -huh. you're going to do and by the way for medical oncology I went to school for an extra year and a half that's for specialization yes. now yeah mm -hmm. so there's a lot of time um, commitments and then you're going to miss out a lot uh, on social life because you'll wow. be spending a lot of time um, at work or in school and then also uh, just knowing that you'll be encountering a lot of human suffering and pain so you have to have the mechanisms to deal with that um, mm -hmm. so I think um, it's it's challenging but it's also rewarding yeah what are some of the other challenges that you face as a Muslim woman yeah and this being a career that is very very demanding you know right. as a girl yeah. back then yeah. growing into a doctor right. tell us a little bit about some other challenges um, some things might become delayed, for example, marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was just coming to that. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, and then uh, perception. So, a lot of times people in our community um, think that girls should not be taken to school. So, there's a lot of that in the community, like, um, what, why are you going to university and you're going to get married and stay at home, you know, so. So, they have this perception yeah. that, you know what, you need to go to university, yeah. but at the end of the day, you'll end up yeah. in the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the idea that a Muslim woman cannot have a career, I think that's not, it's not a correct, um, I mean, it's a barrier that many Muslim women will have. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's just rewind just a little bit. And, yeah. uh, you know, you spent almost 10 years in school, in yeah. university, yeah. studying to become the doctor that you are today. Right. Uh, was marriage, did marriage ever cross your mind? Um, I think it, it, it did, more for my mom than myself, uh -huh. <laughs> it did, but I think there's, especially the last four years when I was here at Aga Khan, 
I was so busy that it wasn't like at the forefront of my, um, it wasn't the thing that I was focusing on. So you were always this career oriented lady? Um, I mean, my career is important to me. It comes first? No, but okay. it's important. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come first, but it's important. Okay, it's one is <laughs> in your priority list. Yeah, it is. We can put it as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. at what age did you get married? I got married at 33. 33? Yeah. Wow, this is very interesting. And yeah. what made you feel like, you know what, this is the right time for me to step into this ne next chapter in my life? I mean, I always wanted to get married, but it wasn't um, something that was, um, that happened. But I think it happened at the right time for me uh, because I had finished all, almost everything in terms of um, education. So it was work, and so it was easy for me to balance my work and my life mm -hmm. at this at the time that I got married. Uh, so, in as much as it was late, according to normal people getting married, for me it was perfect timing. I think Allah just gave it to me at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're going to get a bit personal here. Yeah. So, how did you meet your husband? Um, so we had an arranged marriage. Wow. Um, and for me, it's something that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted. I I didn't want to go through dating and all that there are so, a lot of heartbreaks involved yeah so and i and i think i had reached a point in my religion where this was the right thing so um as you grow in your dean you start seeing the value in certain things and for mm -hmm. me this is what i wanted um uh, and uh, through the help of uh, friends mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we, we got introduced and had uh, meetings that were um, supervised and then and what I was looking for was someone who was um, religious in the sense that they were praying five times a day, they believed in Islam and they were practicing Islam. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that was the biggest thing that, that I wanted and that we shared a few um, common values, yeah. which we did. Mm -hmm. And after a few visits, we said, fine, let's get married. That's still the deal. Yeah. When I met my husband, he, um, just by his personality, I said, this is probably the right person. Wow, mashallah, yeah. God guided you. Yes. Of course, you have uh, yeah. to pray istihara and just uh, <laughs> put God in that, um, you know, in the position. Puzzle. And it's not perfect. You know, like there are arranged marriages that work and there are arranged marriages that don't work. Just the, like the way when people date, there are marriages that work after that and there are marriages that don't work. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is um, putting God, uh, putting Allah first, working hard at it, giving it the attention it deserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many people have this uh, perception that when a woman gets married, yeah. it is the end of her career. Yeah. How true is that? Um, and that's why you have to choose your, your spouse first. So one of the few things that we talked about upfront was that I'm working, I'm going to continue working. That's not going to change. And he was like, yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have this discussion before and just be upfront about what you want as a person. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Dr. Sitna, you know, you're, you're a very serious person because we know you as doctors, you know, we have this perception that doctors, yeah. oh my God, they're so serious, they're so yeah. straight. Which is not true. Really? Yeah. Well, we will be taking a short break, so do not move a muscle because in the next segment, we will get to find out what Dr. Sitna does for fun. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome back to the show. For those of you who are joining us right now, I am still at the Aga Khan University Hospital, joined by the very lovely Dr. Sitna. Welcome to the show. Thank you again. Yes, Dr. Sitna. We have this thing, you know, we believe that doctors are very serious, upright, you know. Mm. Uh, do you have a life? What do you do for fun? Um, I'm actually that's wrong. Doctors are very fun loving. Mm -hmm. yes. Please change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, what do I do for fun? Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy uh, photography. Wow. Yeah. I enjoy baking. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time with my family. So I have young children, so I spend a lot of time in the park mm -hmm. <laughs> with the children. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doctors do. Actually, it's amazing, but doctors do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Most doctors do something different. And that's very helpful to get, you know, the stress out of mm -hmm. um, life. So we do a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I want to dive into the whole aspect of cancer, right. the treatment. And, you know, yeah. it's just becoming like this 
very rare disease that has no cure you know we yeah. ha we know nothing about it mm. well before we get into that you know there's a lot of noise that is happening behind us yes why why yeah. is there so much construction going on here yeah so it's 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 uh, very exciting um we are getting really? the yeah so the construction is because we're getting the first uh top of the uh you know food chain um diagnostic machine which is the wow. pet scan Mm -hmm. So we'll be probably the first country in East and Central Africa that has a PET CT, which is very helpful for cancer diagnosis. Wow, that yeah. is amazing. Yeah. So you just mentioned diagnosis. Right. Now, is there any definite cause of cancer? Because there's this thing, you know, don't eat noodles, don't eat, uh, don't drink coke. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't eat junk. Mm -hmm. Is there any so, definite cause? So for majority of the cancers, we don't have like this is the cause, but there, there are some cancers that are associated with viruses. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, liver cancers are associated with uh, hepatitis B and C. Mm -hmm. And then cervical cancer, which affects a lot of women in Kenya, is actually preventable because it's associated to uh, a virus called human papilloma virus mm -hmm. that is preventable using vaccines. Um, a lot of cancers um, come about because of uh, HIV infection. So that we know that there are cancers that are related to viruses. And then there are cancers that are associated to genetic problems, and those usually, usually run in families, but those are not your most common. They account for about 5 to 10% of all the cancers. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things that we know can cause cancer, like smoking. So smoking is the biggest risk factor for for cancer. cancer yeah and it affects uh, it's not many cancers um, uh, are brought about by smoking like cancer of the lung being the commonest mm -hmm. um, cancers of the the intestines yeah uh, and the feeding tubes mm -hmm. um, so uh, smoking like cuts across most cancers as a key cause of um, cancers mm -hmm. there are certain foods that um, make cancer more likely they're not a direct cause but mm -hmm. they cause what are those foods so uh, usually things like uh, meat, so like nyamachoma, when you cook meat normally and uh, you remove the fat should be fine if mm -hmm. you're eating it in moderate quantities. But nyamachoma in large quantities associated with stomach cancer. Really? And yeah. that's so nice with uh, yeah. the kachumbari. Yeah, but if you, you see if you're taking rarely, it's okay, mm -hmm. but if you're taking large amounts over a long period of time, mm -hmm. um, that is associated with stomach cancer. And mm -hmm. then um, before, before we used to have fridge, most people used to, to preserve their meat using salt. Mm -hmm. So a high um, salt content in your food. Yeah. Of course, there are other things that are helpful, like eating fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. They don't completely um, remove cancer, but they help. So they yeah. help to prevent. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There are very many, uh, there are very few doctors, you know, right. who actually specialize in oncology, especially right. yeah. Muslim women. Right. Very, you're amongst yeah. the very, very few. Right. Now, I want you to tell me yeah. what actually led you to specialize in oncology and yeah. not in any other uh, specialty. Um, so when I was here doing my uh, um, internal medicine in terms of my master's, um, we, that was kind of like my first full exposure to cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And we had this really good um, oncologist who is my mentor and, and my colleague now. Wow. So he kind of made it so interesting, like, you know. And then also oncology is like a really uh, huge field. It's expanding rapidly. Mm -hmm. Every new day there's a new drug that's so being developed. So there's a new market into yeah. it. Yeah, so, so there's, it's like we are learning so much more about cancer every day. And we are getting more and more treatments. So that, you know, before people would be like, you have cancer, you're dying tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have patients in clinic who've been alive for 10, 20 years, wow. you know, five years. And even if they still have disease, they have a life. Mm -hmm. They're not like, you have cancer today, you're going to die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So there's so much um, um, technology, technology and advancement in oncology that it's a truly exciting field. Mm -hmm. So for me, having that mentor at that crucial time when I was deciding what to do and... Um, all the things that have been happening in the last five to ten years made me just choose this um, line wow. of work yeah uh, let's go back uh, during your time as a trainee here right. at uh, the hospital yeah was there any one person like any patient that yeah. you remember till to date yeah. during your experience back then um i mean i remember <laughs> all just my that patients one. <laughs> i think the those patients that i remember because they, their cases were so sad and they died. And then there are those patients that I remember because they lived for 
uh, so long. So when I was training, we had a young boy, he was 12, and he had cancer of the bone. And I remember him because it was so sad because where the cancer was, one of the treatments for cancer is surgery. And we had to amputate his leg uh, below, above the knee. So I remember um, having that very difficult discussion with his, with his mom and dad and with him, because he was about, he was about 14, 16, not 12, he was 14, 16 then. And he's in high school, he's just joined high school. Mm -hmm. And we're telling him, you're going to use crutches for the rest of your life. My. And just the parents just thinking, my son is going to lose a limb. And then just choosing to, to be alive over having a limb. And just I imagine that if I was 14 years, how would that have been mm -hmm. for me? So I always remember him for that because it was such a difficult decision for us to tell them, you know, you have this cancer here and we have to cut your leg. And wow. for the parents who have seen their child growing, saying you're going to lose a limb. And it also brought other things that at 14, are you able to make decisions for yourself? You know, so there was also an ethical question as who can make this decision? Because in Kenya, at 14, you're still a minor. Sure. You, you assent, you, you give your agreement to the procedure, but ultimately your parents make that decision for you. So it was, an, it was a difficult and interesting case because of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as a doctor, you encounter so many patients, right. especially cancer patients. Right. Now, tell me the process where you have to break the news to this person and tell yeah. them, you know what? you have cancer. Yeah. How do you, because I presume you have to be a psychologist, again yeah. preparing this person, you have to be a doctor. Yeah. Tell me about your emotions. Uh, I think over time I've kind of gotten um, uh, used to it. How are you in the beginning? I want to so know <laughs> that face of yeah. your life. I think um, many times people know what is wrong with them. They know that they are sick and then they just don't know what is wrong with them. So. Many times when you tell someone I have cancer, they, they have, at least I know what's wrong with me. But then they have a lot of anxiety about, am I going to die? What will For happen sure. to my children? What will happen to my spouse? What will happen to the rest of my family? Will I live? How long do I? So the next question they always ask is, how long will I live? And I'm just coming to that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> doctors, you have this tendency whereby, you know, you tell someone you have eight months to live. Yeah. Why do you do that? Only Allah can uh, knows when someone, he's the one who knows when you're going to be born, what's going to happen in your life and when you're going to die. Mm -hmm. No human being can tell you that. So what mm -hmm. business do I have telling people um, that? But what we know from experience is that we know the signs of dying. So usually when someone is about to, like getting closer and closer to, to dying, we know that these are the stages of death. And so we, we want to prepare them if they're getting to that point. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, many cancer patients are alive having yeah. been diagnosed with cancer, but there are patients who are going to die from cancer. Mm -hmm. So we know that they're approaching their death. So we want them to, to be prepared for that. We want them, do they have things they need to sort out? They, do they have plots of land they want to, to, to you know, yeah, share? Do out, they have yeah. property that they need to share? Do, do they have people they want to ask forgiveness from? And do they want to talk to people to, you know, to, so that they make yeah. amends before they die? Then there are people who may not have been close to Allah or to whatever spirituality or religion that they are. So we get the, the chaplain to come and talk to them um, to, to just make them ready for the transition, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is fear. There's a lot of fear what is going to happen on the other side. But we, we've kind of learned the way of helping them. We have professionals who can help them through that transition. And also helping the family. So it's not just about the patient, but the family. Because the family have seen this patient through their illness. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be, after the patient dies, they're going to be on their own. Right. Yeah, there's that trauma. So, so there's a lot of trauma. So walking the journey with not just the patient, but the family and the caregivers. So it's difficult when you're starting out in practice. It's very difficult. Tell for me about your experience. I want me, to know behind the scenes what happened <laughs> for, to you. For me, because I'm for a, now, I'm, I know you're I'm very a, used I'm to I'm an it. extremely emotional person. So for wow. me, it was extremely difficult at the beginning. Not telling someone they have cancer, because many times when you tell someone they have cancer, there are many treatments that you can offer. But for me, what was difficult was that we have no new treatments, no other treatments to offer at that point. 
So just within yourself as a doctor saying, look, we've done everything that we can humanly do and there's nothing else I can offer you. I can offer you pain control. I can mm -hmm. offer you comfort. Just something for survival. I can offer you um, comforting words. I can bring your family together. I can make your transition. The worst thing that can happen to a patient is to die when they're in pain. So for us, even after we finished all available treatments, at least we can make sure you didn't die in pain and you had settled the things that you, you wanted to settle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they say no cancer is there. Yeah. But to me, I want to pose a question to you. Is cancer a global lie? Are doctors using to financially mm -hmm. gain from this? Because it is pretty expensive. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish we could have a patient here for you to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Cancer is real. It, it's, it's as real as malaria, you know. And just because malaria is cheap doesn't mean malaria can't kill you. By the way, malaria can kill you. Mm -hmm. But cancer is different in the sense that um, we, we've approached cancer as, as something to be feared. You know, most people are like, you know. And then, obviously, there's some people who use cancer for their gain. For example, there are people who tell you, I can cure your cancer, give me 500,000. And of course, they can't cure your cancer, you mm -hmm. know. So some people use it for gain. But for me, as a practicing oncologist, cancer is, is as real as you and me sitting here. It, it's real, it's mm -hmm. affecting about 40,000 uh, Kenyans, and of those who are affected, at least two-thirds of them are going to die from their cancer in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that they're dying is one, we're not catching them early, and we don't have enough um, diagnostic tools in the peripheries to help them, and we don't have the treatments available. Yes, I'm privileged to work in Aga Khan where I can provide all the things yeah. that patients need, but there are people in the rural Kenya, yeah. and even here in Nairobi, who, mm -hmm. are, who can't afford it and who don't know about it, so they come very late, or who, who are afraid, you know? Mm -hmm. We have many women coming with huge breast lumps. They've mm -hmm. had them for years, you know? And they, it's just like a mass that's fungating. And you're like, where have you been all this time, you know? And they're just so afraid. Sometimes they're afraid of losing their breasts. They're afraid, I don't know you know but mm -hmm. cancer is real to answer your question okay. very real so cancer is associated to yeah. be it was associated to be the sickness for the rich okay right. but today it is affecting anyone and everyone now that local monanchi you just yeah. said how yeah. the rich can afford it yeah. because it's very expensive right. now what about that local monanchi there in one of the slums yeah. and has no money what yeah. happens to that person so, I mean, for the local one, the, the, the thing that has changed in recent years is that the government is really committed to the to alle uh, alleviation of pain and suffering for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. So if you have things like your National Health Insurance Fund, almost all public hospitals have the ability to at least um, uh, diagnose you with cancer. And even if they can't, they can refer you to the referral hospitals. So a diagnosis should not be um, a problem. And with the National Health Insurance, you can get cancer treatment. So the NHIF is supporting a lot of patients, uh, not just in the government hospitals, but even here at Aga Khan. Oh, wow, that's yeah. interesting. So, so that's, that's really um, changed in the last mm -hmm. five to 10 years, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the treatment of cancer. Right. So there is the legalization of what they call the holy hub. Others call it weed yeah. and others call it marijuana. Yeah. So now, do you think that is the solution in Kenya, the legalization of yeah. weed? Um, from a personal, um, this is my yeah. personal what do you think uh, as a doctor? opinion. I think that um, the countries that have legalized it have the frameworks to monitor this, right? We don't have that. Mm -hmm. So the potential for abuse in our society is uh, high. very high. Not for recreational purposes. Right. What about for medicinal purposes? Yeah, so the problem, is, it's, it's, it's like um, marijuana or for medicine purposes, right? It's something that has to be like a controlled drug because mm -hmm. we have other medicines that are for medicinal purposes but are being abused, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, we have codeine in cough syrup. And you know that codeine is being abused uh, out there. That's and that's drug. why now it's very difficult to get codeine without a prescription, uh, the, the syrups with codeine without a prescription. Mm -hmm. So the challenge of having something like medical marijuana is that there's potential for abuse. So you have to have the systems in place 
which we might not have as much as other countries do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Dr. Sitna, on a, ver on a light note, yes. now, I, want to, I have this question, a very burning question. You know, whenever we go to the hospital, the consultation fees are just on another level. Mm -hmm. And then another thing, you know, you said you spent so many years in school. Right. Could this be a compensation? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think that you should look at it like this. If you have a car, yeah, mm -hmm. you take it for service every three months, you don't have a problem paying the five to ten thousand, right? Sure. You actually don't have paying uh, paying four percent of your car value for insurance. Why don't you want to pay for your own health? And this is your body. This is like your. The, if you didn't have a healthy body, you would not be able to do the things that you wanted. So why don't you want to pay for that? Wow, you just compared and, it yeah. to a car service. No, okay. no. What I'm <laughs> saying is that you have your your you have more value. You should value your life. Going to your doctor is not just about writing a prescription. Your doctor will listen to you. Your doctor is your confidant. You're going to tell them, I have a pimple somewhere that you can't <laughs> tell somewhere. Someone That's else. very true. Yeah? yeah. And you know your doctor will not tell anyone your secrets. If you tell your cousin, I have a pimple somewhere, the next day your whole community knows You'll that. You'll be judged for exactly. days. Exactly. Your doctor doesn't judge you. They treat you regardless of anything and everything you bring them. Yeah? And there's a lot more that they offer you just rather than just a, a prescription at the end of the day. So there is value. You need to value that. Mm -hmm. You need to value. Actually, doctors are underpaid. Did you know that? Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In fact, we our, our charges... Have you ever gone to a lawyer? <laughs> yeah, and seen mm -hmm. how much they charge you? So doctors actually don't charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's value for money. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. To wrap up this show, yeah. what message do you have to tell Kenyans out there, young girls aspiring yeah. to be doctors yeah. just like you? Right. I think for, for, for us Muslims, you can be a Muslim woman practicing your deen and still have a career. It doesn't mean that uh, you can't do that. You respect yourself, you respect the people around yourself and you believe in, in, in your faith and have faith in Allah. You can do both. I think that's my first message. The second message is that Muslims and especially Muslim women don't really like taking care of yourselves. You need to take care of your health. One of the, the challenges we have is cervical cancer in Kenya. It's completely preventable. You can get a vaccine and you can get your pap smear and your checks and you can prevent this cancer that's killing lots and lots of women. So that's my message to women. My message to the men. <laughs> hey, the men, you have not been left behind. Is, is that you need to take care of yourselves because many times men don't like going to hospital, right? Mm -hmm. They wait until it's too late. You need to take care of yourself so that because you are our head, you need to be able to, to take care of yourself to take care of us. So, I mean, th I think that would be our challenge to Muslim men and women. What is the way forward for cancer in Kenya? Um, I think the way forward is not to fear it, to, to spread the message that um, there are some cancers that we can do a lot about uh, and you need to get involved and you need to go and get yourselves checked and screened. You also need to uh, invest in health insurance, whether it's the NHIF or other things, because these treatments are expensive, but with, with these things, it will really help to 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 meet that need mm -hmm. yeah that's what i would say well you have heard it all from dr sitna we have come to the end of the meeting with show it has been a pretty educative program well they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away but how many of you out there take that statement seriously i have been your host aisha khan goodbye for now until next time Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation.